What's going on guys? It's K-Dub here with another episode of Crypto Zombie. So today is Sunday. Pleasure to have you back on the channel. Hope you're having a great weekend so far. This is actually the third weekend I've done a video on Sunday. I usually don't, but I could get used to it. I can get used to it. Now, let's have a look at what is going on in the markets. So, you know, we're seeing some green, some red. Now, the losses are very minimal today. It's only like 1%, 2%. Nothing really too crazy. No major casualties. Bitcoin is still sitting above that $4,000 mark, okay? We have lost about a billion dollars since last night, but it's nothing really that crazy compared to what we have seen. If we have a look at the biggest gainers of the day, we have Freecoin up 187%. But the real question is, is it really free? Probably not. We also have Centrality, Zcoin, Dex, MobileGo, Waves, Huobi Token, Komodo Maker, and Bitcoin SV all up for the day. Now, a lot of people are saying we could potentially go down to 3K or even all the way down to $1,000, which if you actually have a look at this chart right here, I mean, currently, yeah, if we were to go down to, uh, let's say just, let's say 3,000, right? 3,000 would put us way, way, way down here. Um, yeah, so 3,000 would basically put us all the way back to August of 2017, and if we went down to $1,000, they had a peak right over in January, so that would basically erase pretty much two years of crypto. Just wipe it clean off the board. Is it possible? Well... Well, it could, yeah, anything's possible in crypto, guys. But, you know, you have Tom Lee. Now, he's calling for a $15,000 Bitcoin by the end of this year. We only have a month left. So for Bitcoin to go from 4000 to 15000 in a month, is it possible? It is, but that is definitely quite a prediction being made by him. Now, I wanted to talk about some other stuff. So you have Mark... Yusko, and he is from Morgan Creek Capital Management. Surprisingly, he's actually from the traditional finance realm, and he expressed that cryptocurrencies are likely to succeed in the long haul. So he talked about all these different things like the ETFs that are coming in, and he says that he totally missed the mark on how these contracts would affect the market. He explained that artificial selling pressure or rehypothecation has been directly placed on Bitcoin in spite of the fact that futures aren't physically backed. But this, of course, was likely said to attribute to Bitcoin's most recent sell-off, which forced the digital asset under 4000 obviously. So, he also went on to explain that rehypothecation will be phased out of the cryptocurrency markets in the future, pending on the adoption of Bitcoin as a viable store of value, which may subsequently catalyze a leg higher. Okay, so basically he says investors don't need a very long time horizon at all to make a good return on Bitcoin. Chiming in on this, you had Michael Busella, formerly from Goldman Sachs Canada. Now, he recently said the exact same thing. Basically, he's waiting for Bitcoin to fall one leg lower before totally bottoming, and he expects a subsequent sharp rebound to the upside, which may put short-term speculators into the green. Now, getting back to Yusko, he noted that over the next decade, he does believe that Bitcoin could easily see a 20x upside um, with its asymmetric risk profile. And he also explained that when it comes down to the nitty gritty, Bitcoin is a network, not a currency or a company, before adding that the world's largest corporations are based on networks, not necessarily specifically products. Networks don't grow based on economic growth, interest rates, or profits. Instead, they grow on technology changes, regulatory changes, etc. Okay? Now, obviously, speaking back to Vitalik's opinion on it, a lot of people say, well, you know, Ethereum, what, what, what is it right now? Well, it's basically been a vehicle for fundraising. And uh, with all the stuff coming out with the SEC and the ICOs, we'll have to see about that. More on that in a bit. But basically, he says that he considers Ethereum to basically just be like a world computer. He thinks that's a good way of describing it, a public blockchain-based open source platform because its purpose is to aid collaboration through a shared computing environment. He calls a lot of the big corporate blockchain stuff wasteful, Regarding IBM's blockchain, for example, he says, I don't understand this deeply, but the detail that jumps out at me is that they're saying, hey, we own all the IP and this is basically our platform and you're getting on it. And like, that's totally not the point. So he also thinks that some of the best use cases for blockchain tech are for payment rails. When asked what industries he thinks that blockchain is most val valid for, he actually just said cryptocurrencies. 
and making international payments easier. He says, I feel like actual utilities in the space are, are starting to get closer to things that are more and more purely digital. Now, this is his opinion. He also goes on to say he's been reading this book called Stubborn Attachments, A Vision for a Society of Free, Prosperous, and Responsible Individuals. And uh, commenting on the book, he says that both reasoning from behavioral and economic first principles and my personal experience, people are at their most evil out of fear, not greed. Growth means there is less fear going around. Now, to talk about some of the things that's happening right now, so we need to talk about the G20 Summit. So you also have the co-founder of Hong Kong-based crypto exchange, BTCC, saying that Bitcoin is slowly chipping away at the monopoly of government-backed fiat currencies. In a new tweet about the latest G20 meeting of world finance leaders, Bobby Lee says that he believes that Bitcoin and crypto revolution is irreversible. So what's going on with the G20? Let's talk about it. So Basically, the G20 conference, which is happening currently at this moment right now in Buenos Aires, has produced a decision which will be interesting to the cryptocurrency world. The uh, attendant politicians have signed a document which indicates their intention to begin working on a solution to the issue of cryptocurrency tax, and that will collaborate to this end. Now, okay, let's, let's go on for one more second, and then I'll get into it. So... The leader's declaration mentions that the construction of an international system which will tax cross-border payments, okay? So this is important because if um, it's not legal for a government to tax a foreign company which does not have a physical presence on that government's territory, but there is evidence that this rule is being used to avoid tax, a tactic made possible by cryptocurrency. So... The declaration declares that all G20 countries are to work on some proposals and discuss them further when they meet next year in Japan. Reportedly, they intend to have a final version by the year 2020. So if this is any indication on how slow the traditional world moves at snail pace, okay? These guys are meeting, they're having this, they're going to talk about crypto and taxes, but around 2020, we'll have something figured out. So that's basically what's going on over there, guys. Now, I wanted to talk about this tweet from Nick Carter because it kind of kind of puts you in memory lane, even though I wasn't around when Bitcoin was first created. I was, but I wasn't paying attention. But he says there's something about Bitcoin talk threads from 2010 to 2011 that is just so special. All the objections to Bitcoin were covered then and debated with respect and erudition. No comparison with the current level of discourse. But going back, I actually got interested myself and I wanted to d dive into these and see what was up. So this is actually a post from Satoshi Nakamoto himself, and it was entitled Bitcoin Point Two release version you know 0 0.2 has been released and i was just looking at some of the responses and you got roger rabbit down here and he says hello great work let me just say that i love the idea behind this project and support it fully i'm very enthused on the direction this is headed and i hope more people soon realize the potential of such a service that i am now glad to be a part of let's hope to see this around for a while instead of fizzing out into the dark like some other projects i've seen start to prosper anyway here's hoping that bitcoin stays around for a while and this was January 12th of 2010. Now, the thing is, is you realize a lot of the same conversations were happening, you know, uh, nine, 10 years ago that are happening now. For example, you know, this guy says, what do you think? Bit now, this is in June 6th of 2011. He says, what do you think the Bitcoin price will do? Short, medium, and long-term future. Is bigger and more well-known exposure of Bitcoin going to be the main factor for driving up the price? Would a bubble type even happen for any reason? Now, keep in mind, if we do want to go back to June 6th of 2011, I'm just curious what the price was back then. I can't even find it here. We actually have to go to a completely different one. So let's go to Bitstamp. Bitstamp goes back a long, long, long time ago. So once again, going back to June 6, 2011, I really, let's see, June 6, 2011. Yeah, so that doesn't even go back that far, but it looks like Bitcoin was probably somewhere... Wow. Five bucks, maybe three bucks. Holy crap. Okay. That's really cheap. Anyway. So he goes on to, you know, ask, and then the, uh, the person responds, if some people knew that they would be rich, wouldn't they? I'm sure they would all be hoping for Bitcoin to succeed, but it still has to overcome a few things first. 
So where have we heard stuff like this before? Then you have somebody that says, what will drive up the price is usability utility by more people than more functions. For this, we need more user-friendly fault-tolerant software, more apps using the API, more businesses willing to trade goods and services for Bitcoin. I think that all these things are coming and the speed at which they come determines on how rapidly the price will likely rise. The only real risk to Bitcoin is competition by another cryptocurrency or something better. And I think that is a small risk. A cryptocurrency with state sanction could conceivably do it, although it would be suicide for the government. There is nothing like Bitcoin. Eventually, it may replace the currency used for the majority of large transactions. There is a smaller risk of a security flaw large enough to destabilize the currency. But that risk is smaller than the risks of other currencies. It's much easier to counterfeit banknotes, for example. So, guys, we were having these conversations way, way, way back in 2011. So I just thought that was really interesting. But the one thing I wanted to point about is that according to Joseph Lubin, as you guys know, he's co-founder of Ethereum, he says blockchain is more than a market, it's a movement. Market cap doesn't reflect activity. Decentralized networks are growing. So check this out. 10 billion daily API requests for Infura. 1 million Truffle downloads. 1 million MetaMask downloads. 12,000 live Ethereum nodes. 48 million unique Ethereum addresses, okay? Um, um, three times the LinkedIn blockchain jobs opening. And he just goes on here to talk about blockchains are solving real world problems. Governments get it. Israelis in crypto, uh, Israelis, excuse me, wow, Israel's encrypted messaging system, Estonia's electronic healthcare record. Tra you could read all this, guys. It's a lot. I don't have enough time to go through all this. But I mean, literally, the guy goes on and on and on to talk about all the things that, you know, blockchain is really changing moving forward. And the thing is, the scary thing in the background is you still have guys on the other side of the fence that are, don't even care about crypto talking about this imminent crash that could potentially happen. So you have a Eureka Alert saying that the near future of the global economy looks extremely bleak. Leak. The pessimistic forecast comes from advanced statistical analysis, the S. And P500 stock market index recently published by scientists from the Institute of Nuclear Physics of the Polish Academy of Science in uh, Krakow. Based on their analysis, the researchers explain why in up to a dozen or so years, we could expect a financial meltdown such as never before. I'm not going into this giant article, but this is what they're saying, guys. And you have to ask yourself, which side of the fence do you want to be on? You know, I mean, personally, I'd rather hold some Bitcoin than be involved in this debacle and this mess when it does eventually potentially happen but that's my opinion that's what I choose to do not financial advice but obviously if you guys are watching this show you must have some belief in a decentralized future now maybe not a hundred percent I think there should definitely be that balance I, I mean realistically speaking we need a balance okay I don't I don't feel comfortable leaving everything to machines to AI personally like I would like a person to be able to come in and you know hit a kill switch just in case something gets out of control but that being said moving forward let's talk about the story of the day because this is something that we all need to worry about, especially, you know, at my channel. I mean, I talk about all kinds of cryptos, all kinds of projects. I mean, we've done so much on this channel. And now the SEC's next move is social media influencers who promoted crypto ICOs. So basically... They go on to say, that when is an ICO promotion a fraud? Well, it says writers, YouTube celebrities, cryptocurrency review platforms, publications, and many more individuals and organizations could be targeted by the SEC if there's sufficient evidence to prove that an individual or an organization received compensation from ICO organizers to promote a token sale without disclosing the amount received from an ICO project to the target audience. Now, right off the bat, this is something that caught my attention because I know a lot Lot of different influencers that have done sponsored content. I've done sponsored content on the channel. So not only are they saying um, to say that it was sponsored, but now you have to disclose the actual amount. So that kind of was interesting to me. And I know pretty much no one has done that. So how is that going to affect everyone? They, they go on to say any celebrity or individual who promotes a virtual token or coin that is a security must disclose the nature, scope, and the amount of compensation received in exchange for the promotion. So, well, let me let me finish this article, then let me let me talk about it a little bit. So they go on to say, we don't believe Bitcoin is a security. Okay, we're good. So we can talk about Bitcoin, guys. Many of the ICOs that you see and you talk about are securities. Now, I'm over here looking at this, um, saying to myself, my God, there's 2,073 cryptos 
currently right now. Now, are they considering ICOs like, okay, so if they're saying most ICOs are securities, does that mean like a lot of these tokens are all securities? So basically everything on coin market cap is a security, which is mostly what people talk about. So that's another thing that we have to consider. But getting back to the article, let's continue. They go on to say, if you're going to offer or sell securities, you have to do so in compliance with our laws. We've been clear about that. The recent actions further emphasize that our security laws to apply to the IC apply to the ICO space. And if people are going to raise money using ICOs, they either have to do so in private placement or register with the SEC, which is why you've actually seen a lot of the recent ICOs just completely not even letting regular people get in. They've been doing all private sales, only accredited investors, all right? They also say promoting an ICO recognized as a security without disclosing compensation to the target audience could result in a penalty that is twice larger than the compensation itself. So as seen in the case of, you know, Mayweather, he was paid Oh, he had to pay over 600000 for receiving 300000 to promote these ICOs. So there are a lot of questions still concerning this just yet. I mean, obviously, if you're a content creator, you need to disclose what you're doing, guys. So that's number one. But the other thing, too, is they need to be a little clear on, like, what are, like, okay, how are you disclosing it? Because, for example, these guys were paid in dollars, okay? Most crypto... Um, Influencers, whether it be blog posts or Twitter or, um, you know, ICO reviews, I assume that they're paid in crypto. So the question is, is how do you report that? Like, do you report that in dollar amounts at the time of the payment? Or like, say you get paid in the token, right? And the token depreciates over time. Are you, you know, like now do you pay the percentage of the token as it decreased? So I still think that there's a lot of gray area, but what this is telling me is that they're getting very, very serious. In fact, this is something that's now entering my neck of the woods. So it's definitely something we need to keep an eye on, pay attention, always definitely stay as transparent as possible. And yeah, I mean, it's scary. You know, but what are you going to do, guys? Honestly, that's why I've been really just focusing on the news because they need to just figure this crap out. So anyway, moving on. That's enough. I'm sure that's not the last we're going to hear about that. But we need to talk about some good news. So Siren Labs has released its blockchain phone, Finny. So not only is Finny phone a blockchain phone, but it's also considered a premium smartphone built with the highest of standards and comparable with the likes of Apple and Samsung. The phone supports all the industry standards featuring a 12 megapixel camera and a 128 128 gigabytes of built-in storage with expandable memory and more. So what's pretty cool though is the phone is $1,000, but you can get a 10% discount on the phone if you pay using Siren tokens. So that's kind of cool. I mean, you can get the phone for 900 bucks if you pay in Siren tokens and you could do it as a quick swap. You know, you could just buy it real quick, send it over. And so, you know, there you go. Finny phone. And this is what the market does. Typical crypto. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about something that they did fix this, but it was an issue. So uh, Ethereum Classics GitHub apparently got taken over by somebody um, who, who, like an unknown individual who then removed all of the admins. Now, obviously, this doesn't affect Ethereum Classic. It's just the GitHub. It's just a repository where they basically just put commits, but it still happened, which is crazy. So I guess long story short, they said that everything is all right. They found the guy or whatever, whatever happened and everything's fine. But that was pretty Pretty crazy that happened over time. Now let's talk about our good old buddy Craig Wright. So speaking on Bitcoin SV, he says that the first change was to up the megabytes to 128. Okay, so this quadrupled it from Bitcoin Cash. Okay, fine. We're all right with that, even though we have some concerns over the potential software. But then he goes on to say that they are going to be able to do one terabyte blocks in two years. Now, two years is, um, you know, not that long, considering that, you know, Bitcoin's been around for, you know, a decade, but it's a lot. And is it necessary? So he goes on and it says, of the three important Bitcoin versions in the wild, Bitcoin SV currently has the smallest blocks and therefore the fewest transactions. But they do say that they're going to try to increase awareness over time by bringing other businesses on board. Um, you know, to put that into perspective, guys, Guys, you know, uh, 1,024 megabytes equals a gigabyte and 1,024 gigabytes equals a terabyte. So I just kind of want you to understand how massive that is. And we're not even, we're not even filling what we have right now. So yes, we are going to need this in the future, but I think it's important to focus on the security of the software before we focus on increase of block size. Personally, that's just my opinion. You may feel differently about it. I just think that it's, you know 
It's kind of crazy. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about Stellar. So it looks like according to data obtained from uh, Stellar Expert, which is a block explorer, that, um, yeah, it looks like a 500% increase in uh, active uh, Stellar accounts, which is which is crazy. So apparently it says in 2018, they had, in the beginning, they had around 1,000 and, uh, excuse me, 162,000. By mid-year, they had over 512, and currently they have 2 million which is insane. So they say the most important cause of growth was probably that big airdrop that they did when they, uh, you know, basically partnered with blockchain.com. But to kind of put it into perspective, this is the growth chart. I mean, you can see from 2016 and it's just massively blown up. Um, now we're starting to level out a little bit. So you can kind of see like we are using it, but Obviously, price doesn't reflect the use case. Oh, also, before we move on, I just wanted to say this person on Reddit is saying beware of a scam, an airdrop XLA token potentially on uh, Stellar. I don't know anything about this. I never heard anything about this, so I don't want to make any opinions of this, but I do want to let you know that they're saying this is a scam. So please, if if you're involved in this or you're looking at XLA, just have a look at it. I don't know if it is or not. I'm just letting you know, have a look at it, okay? Public service announcement. Okay, so also I want to talk about something with XRP. So it looks like Coin Market Cap is actually responding to some members of the XRP community who say that the market data on Coin Market Cap is not correct. So Ripple's own chief market strategist agrees with those that say coin market cap should include the 55 billion XRP owned by Ripple to be part of the market cap. Now, if they were to include that, it would, you know, drop the price a little bit, but it would be good long term to have more transparency on the ones that are, you know, held in the reserves, uh, you know, that are owned by Ripple as well. Now, also I want to talk, I have a lot of coin news today. I know a lot of coin news going on. So I want to talk about NEO. So on November 30th, they announced their collaboration with NSPCC that they are developing a distributed file storage system that would work as a cornerstone of the NEO platform. So this would be NEO FS, obviously for file storage, distributed file storage. So this would allow users to take back control of their data and would be as, as simple to use as Dropbox or Amazon S3, according to them. The move is targeting those concerned with their privacy. You can actually watch a little video right here if you guys want. And it says, often enough, the servers that store your data is owned by a big company, and that company becomes an owner of your files. They can take a peek at what you share to sell you something or to tell you something. So why not take back your control with Neo FS. Now, in the same vein, we did have China's tech giant Tencent informing people that Neo developers and node operators about a bug which could potentially allow hackers to steal tokens remotely. So, according to Tencent Security Lab, uh, when a user starts a network node with the default configuration, they are at risk of losing funds. So, Tencent Security Arm published on the Chinese social media platform Weibo alerting users about the critical bug. The firm warns all the node maintainers and gas holders to pay attention to their wallet security and update the client version in time. So they have some steps down here. If you guys are interested, upgrade the client, uh, don't run RPC uh, function, etc. So check this out if you guys are interested. As you can see over here, a few other people are reporting it. And this is essentially the uh, initial translation. Now, it, it, you know, obviously it wasn't in English, so it has been translated. Uh, if you guys want more information on that, obviously do your own research into this, but that's what Tencent, uh, you know, Research Labs is saying. Also in the same topic of NEO, we do have Apex. I don't even know. I just thought this was kind of funny. They, they literally just put out the 12 nodes of CP Xmas and it's like some little, uh, phase one is like, dashboard. You can run a node too. He said, as in walked Jimmy who great work, said Jimmy clad in red with a white beard and a cap too. It's time. All right, so you see, it's basically just like a cute little, you know, Christmas story thing. I thought it was kind of funny, kind of interesting. So moving on here with a few more things before we skedaddle on out of here and end this weekend with a bang. We have the company, which is the exclusive U.S. partner of cryptocurrency exchange giant Huobi, says it is the first campaign of its kind in the United States. So this is HBUS, and they are launching a billboard, uh, apparently, um, campaign, and this is it right here. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's Wall Street, Coinbase, HBUS. So I guess that's it. That's what the excitement's all about. So a part of the campaign is also removing trading fees, which is pretty cool, as a way of incentivizing users on the platform. Now, I don't know if this is, I'm sure it's not going to be forever. They're probably just doing this temporarily to get users on. 
And, um, you know, CEO Frank Fu says there's no question that digital, digital assets have taken its share of hits this year. We wanted to give crypto traders a break when it comes to the high fees they regularly have to pay when trading on other exchanges. It's time American traders are given freedom and more options when it comes to uh, when they want to buy their digital assets. Oh, by the way, guys, if you're in New York, you, you're not allowed to use HBUS. Just letting you know that. So, yeah, that includes myself. So let's end on some good news and then let's get out of here. So I wanted to talk about a 50-year-old bookstore in Bangalore, which is one of the oldest in India, has taken the digital route, accepting Bitcoin payments for books. So it's called Sapna Online. The web store of the Sapna bookstore has been around since 2001. So this makes them among the first websites in the country to sell books online much before Amazon, which is interesting. So by accepting Bitcoin payments, they become the first such store to accept them for books over there. Um, the interesting thing is they have over a million registered users, over 500,000 daily active users, and it has won multiple awards and recognitions in the past. The website has a large collection of books ranging from educational textbooks to comics and manga. So that's good news. And if that doesn't make you happy, guys, check out this car wash that is apparently accepting Bitcoin. Now, I used to actually own a car wash, guys, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know how they could do this without a lightning network because sometimes those lines get kind of long. So if you need to validate Bitcoin transactions, you know, by the time those guys get out the other end, you might not even have, a, you know, a validation yet. But I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, we come to you. So maybe maybe you send the transaction and while they're driving is when they uh, <laughs> they see if it works. So I don't know, guys. It's crazy. But hey, they are accepting Bitcoin adoptions around the corner. That being said, I want to say thank you so much for coming to this Sunday edition of the news. Um, obviously, it was a lot of coin talk today. There wasn't really anything crazy going on. I mean, obviously, the SEC cracking down on crypto influencers. And, you know, that's, that's something for everyone to be concerned about, you know. But other than that, not really too much going on in the news today. So that being said, guys, I want to say thank you so much for coming back. Uh, and spending time with me on this Sunday. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys are having a great weekend. I will definitely see you tomorrow on Monday. Thank you for everyone who's been liking, subscribing, commenting, everyone that's been joining the Crypto Zombies Telegram. You guys freaking rule. That being said, my name's K-Dub. This is Crypto Zombie. Until next time, stay crypto and peace out.